Here are a few news clips about the bookmaking operation that Fred and I busted back in the 80s. Uh, this is how other news outlets besides 60 Minutes cover the story. Illegal betting on sporting events is a national pastime to the tune of $35 billion a year. But here in Los Angeles, it's an obsession. Simply put, we are the sports betting capital of America. Michael Tuck has a special report. Bree, believe it or not, last year, Angelinos bet an astounding $6 billion on sports, all of it illegally. That puts bookmaking right behind drug dealing as the largest criminal enterprise in all of California. Over the next three nights, I'm going to take you inside the shadowy world of sports betting. You will meet the penny ante winners and the million-dollar losers, the cops and the con men, the bettors and the bookies. 104 on the run line. 200. One line for 200? Yeah. 118 on the run line for 200. It may just seem that way, but in America, it seems that everybody bets on sports. 120 run line. For how much? 21. We bet on everything. Basketball, baseball, even golf. Some bet small, some bet big. It's legal here in Las Vegas, where nearly $2 billion is bet every year on sports. To bet on tonight's games here in Las Vegas, all you do is walk up to the sports desk and give the man your money. It's even easier to bet illegally in Los Angeles. A bookie is never more than just a phone call away. Hi, can you give me the line on the NCAA? This is Kenny, number 41. You got Ohio State minus four for a nickel, Minnesota minus two and a half for a nickel, and a $200 par. The action never stops here in the sports betting capital of the world. The bets, like the one placed by a movie tycoon, can be astronomical. I said, what's in the briefcase? He says, he says, be careful with it. There's a million dollars in there. It's a Super Bowl bet that he just lost. He was paying off a one million dollar Super Bowl bet. The bigger the game, the bigger the action. What's the line on Duke? Five and a half. Give me a hundred on Duke minus five and a half. How much you bet? I don't want to commit myself. I might be on national television. <laughs> only bet two bucks. My wife would kill me. How much you bet on the game? <laughs> That's a tough question. I'll say hundred dollars. You know, I'm hoping that uh, that Duke picks it up a little bit so I so I can beat the spread. You bet big sporting events or everything. Everybody here has made a bet on this game. Raise your hand. Of those who bet illegally, few think it's wrong. Ray, a big-time gambler, tells this story about his bookie. I have a particular friend that takes action from a particular section of the police department, we'll say. Once a year, they'll call him up and they'll say, uh, listen, we're having a big roundup this weekend. Can you make it in on Saturday morning? And they'll go, yeah. He'll grab a handful of slips and they'll come in there and stick out his hands and they, you know, put him behind his back and he just... You know, they hangs, get the TV cameras hangs his on head us. down as he walks, walks across the room, and that's it. You know, they put him in jail. He's in for five minutes. He pays a $100 fine, and he's gone. So if so many people break the law anyway, should sports betting be legalized in California? I think the government can gather its tax revenue from it. I think it should be legalized. I'd be afraid. You'd be afraid? Yeah, personally, I feel like I might lose a little too much then. Well, tomorrow you will meet the man other bookies say is the biggest bookmaker in history, a man who allegedly controls a worldwide, multi-billion dollar illegal industry from a ranch right near Los Angeles. Okay, specifically, what is the law on bookmaking? Bree, technically, it's, it's every bit as illegal to make a bet as it is to take one, but in practice, the cops hardly ever arrest bettors, and when they bust a, bust a bookie, generally he's fined just a few hundred dollars, he's set free, and he's back taking bets again later that night. Meanwhile, the state of California gets nothing from it. They get it. nothing mm -hmm. from it. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Last night, I showed you how easy it is to bet with a bookie and how all sorts of people do it. Tonight, we follow the money through the underground world of the bookmaker. You may not know Ron Sacco, but if you've ever bet with a bookie, he likely knows you. Sacco controls a multi-billion dollar a year enterprise, all of it illegal. Simply put, Ron Sacco may be the biggest bookie in history. Yellow, we got uh, Minnesota two and a half, Lakers four, and Ohio. All right, hold it a minute. Minnesota minus two, six to five. Atlanta plus ten for a nickel. Lakers minus three and a half, six to five. Michigan plus four and a half, 240 to two. All right, good luck. Like cautious businessmen everywhere, bookies hedge their bets. When the action gets too heavy on one team, the bookmaker himself will bet on that team and place the bet with a bigger operator. Can be uh, Michigan. Plus four and a half for a nickel. 
Then give me Michigan plus five, six to five. At the very top of the pyramid is this man, the bookie's bookie, Ron Sacco. It is the opinion of other bookmakers that Ron Sacco is the largest bookmaker probably in world history. Back in the mid-1980s, Sacco was just one of a dozen large-scale L.A. bookmakers, but he foresaw the potential of the electronics revolution. He decided to go high-tech with computerized systems, satellite systems, international 800 telephone systems, do what other corporations do, put everything on computer to keep track of it. Uh, Give everybody an account number. Dan Hanks was Sacco's electronics wizard. We bought a thousand feet of 25 pair cable and ran the cable over these phone line, uh, telephone pole lines ourselves to run it into this building so that the phones would be registered someplace else, but they would come into this building. This building was alarmed so that Sacco sitting in his office would know if the cops hit this building. Despite all his precautions, though, the cops finally busted Sacco's L.A. operation. So he moved to Las Vegas, where he expanded in size and scope. On that day, June 30th, this better made a total of eight bets in which he lost to Ron Sacco a total of $27,800. These are the amounts, the total amounts owed to him by betters who have lost to his organization. I see $52,000 down here, $10,000, $9,000, $34,000. These are a total approximately 50 or 60 betters, and there's about five or $600,000 represented on here, and he had hundreds and hundreds of betters. How did some of Sacco's losers in Los Angeles settle up? A lot of people that bet pay by check. I just go up to the door, knock on the door, the after hours, but a woman would come to the door and she'd recognize me and she'd let me in the bank. I'd be in there about two minutes, I'd make a exchange of a package of checks for cash, you know, it might be $60,000. It would be in a sealed envelope. Sacco got busted again, and this time he did a year in prison in Nevada. But nothing could stop his booming business. Investigators say he expanded in New York and Philadelphia, where his operation was sanctioned by organized crime and supervised by Joe the Cadillac Landmesser, a one-time associate of the notorious Bruno Scarfo crime family. I went to a meeting in Staten Island uh, at a, an Italian restaurant. The scene looked like something right out of The Godfather. I mean, we walked in, and it was all these guys that... There, everybody had the middle name of The. You know, it was Louis the Scarf. According to authorities, Sacco made one final brilliant move to the Dominican Republic. So that he could set up an operation to receive bets in a jurisdiction where gambling is legal, but to receive bets from all over the world in locations where it is illegal. He is the largest telephone subscriber in the Dominican Republic. And where is the world's biggest bookie today? on this plush horse ranch near Los Angeles, where he reportedly uses seven satellite dishes to control his multi-billion dollar empire. Ron Sacco is back home. Made it so all you gotta do is make a phone call from anywhere in the world, and you can place a bet. Now, we spoke with Ron Sacco's lawyer, and he vigorously denies that Sacco is connected with organized crime. He added, though, that Sacco has no control over who bets with him, and organized crime figures, he said, may do that from time to time. Tomorrow, you will meet the people who place the bets, from the businessman who put down a hundred on a championship game to make it interesting, to the movie tycoon who routinely won and lost close to half a million dollars at a pop. Illegal sports betting is a $15 million a day business in Los Angeles. Tonight, you'll meet the people who make the bets, the casual better, the compulsive gambler, and the studio executive who wins and loses half million dollar fortunes. The stupid bet for the better, but they bet it. And they bet on horses whose name rhymes with their kid, you know, or you know, the, the birthday of their their first sweetheart or something like that. They bet for stupid reasons. Give me a hundred on Duke minus five and a half. You wouldn't enjoy this game if you didn't put money on it. No, absolutely not. Patrick is a casual gambler, always betting well within his means. That was not the case, though, with Stanley. My worst week was when I bet every football game on the board except one probably 60 or 62 college football games on a Saturday because you're a dentist how can you have this monumental ego about winning a football team when you don't even I'll ask him I'll say well who's the starting running back on tip this week we never use the word in I don't know well, who's the best defensive player well, I don't know
Raymond can't afford not to know. He's a professional gambler, and he takes into account every factor which can affect a game. The important ones start with, of course, the coach and the school and their attitude. I then make my judgments based on what I feed into the computer, okay? My computer now talks to a larger system that we have set up that four of my friends can talk to also. One on the East Coast, one in Miami, one in Texas, one in Michigan. Hello. We got uh, Minnesota two and a half, Boston ten, Dallas two and a half. I shop the lines in my cities, and my colleagues shop the lines in their cities. If it's a California team playing a Michigan team, the chances are that 10 to 15 times a year we get a situation where all we've got to do is bet the Michigan side in Michigan and the L.A. side here. You win both ends. Raymond and his associates bet about $25,000 a week. And like prudent businessmen everywhere, they plow their winnings back into next season's stake. I don't care how tough my team played and how they almost covered and all that. Uh, I care about the plus and the minus column. What Raymond does on a relatively small scale, the man who lives here, Agura surgeon Ivan Minlin, did on an enormous scale. Minlin and his aptly named computer group placed multi-million dollar bets in at least 11 states. It was a very sophisticated operation. The only thing that's going to be messed up is that satellite light before I have to get uh, somebody in there to look at the satellite. light. One time, Lorimore Pictures partner Irwin Molaski won and lost fortunes with Mindlin betting for him. I left 430 with him. 430. I told him we were in that guy's place until 4 in the morning counting money. Arnie's fingers are still green. He can't get it to come off. We're at the guy's kitchen table. He's making his hot post them. And we're counting pack after pack. And Susan, I swear, some of the packs had ones in them. Molaski won big. Stanley lost everything. If I ever bet what I could afford, I really didn't enjoy the bet because it didn't matter. I only enjoyed it when I bet more than I could afford. Eventually got to the point where I did not want a score to come across KNX without me having a bet on it, without me sweating that score. There were a couple instances where I actually stole money from my father um, just so I can go to Las Vegas, win some money so I can pay off the bookmaker. It's a sad story. Stanley lost his business, lost his wife, and lost his children before he finally joined Gamblers Anonymous, where he does have plenty of company anyway. Compulsive gambling is the fastest growing addiction among American teenagers. Mm, I noticed that uh, Dr. Midland and his computer group were indicted for betting. So what happened? Uh, they're all found not guilty. The jury apparently thinking the way the majority of the American public thinks, that making a bet is okay, but taking a bet is illegal. That's what people think anyway. Estimated that Americans wagered almost $37 billion last year on big-time sports, and much of that illegally, much of it by telephone. Tonight, NBC's Brian Ross reports on the biggest bookie crackdown in U.S. history. Brian? Tom, until this week, the people who run the huge illegal sports gambling business thought they had a sure thing, a high-tech, offshore bookies paradise that handled hundreds of millions of dollars a year in sports bets. Just last weekend, the betting was heavy as the Buffalo Bills and three other NFL teams won big games in the playoffs leading up to the Super Bowl. It was a big day in the NFL, and it was a big day for this man. The man law enforcement authorities say is by far the biggest bookmaker in American history, Ron Sacco. Sacco, in his baseball cap and his gold Lincoln, is a familiar figure to police and federal agents in California who say Sacco is a kind of criminal genius who figured out a way to turn mob bookmaking into a multinational business. The secret to the Sacco operation was to move American bookies offshore to the Caribbean, to the Dominican Republic. And for the last year and a half, this luxury home became the nerve center of American sports gambling equipped with its own satellite dishes and microwave antennas for state-of-the-art computers and an 800-number phone bank. It all ended this week when the FBI asked Dominican police to move in. And when the police and an NBC News camera crew arrived, the bets were still pouring in from American bettors using the 800 number and their own secret bettors number to get in on the action. 502C. 
Buffalo minus 11 for a nickel, okay. Buffalo minus 11, 11.60 for one little dime. 11.60, Buffalo minus 11 for a dime. You got it. Thank you. Bye. Denver, hey. over, right? What? Over 195 and a half for 1,000. Two dimes plus four. Bullets plus four for 2,000, 7301. Okay. In the investigation, police say they seized several million dollars. Authorities also seized these photos the bookmakers apparently took of themselves in their bookies' paradise. And what may be very embarrassing for people back in the States, lists of telephone numbers from cities all across the country used to place illegal bets. This was described as the largest American bookmaking operation with over $100 million a month being bet. William McGivern is the U.S. attorney in San Francisco, whose office, along with the FBI, began the investigation of the offshore bookies. Not only the massive nature of the organization uh, makes it significant, but also the fact that the technology they used, they felt, was going to evade investigative uh, techniques. This investigation of mob sports gambling has already led to a race-fixing scandal in Canada involving the drugging of horses. And authorities are now investigating similar allegations of racetrack and professional sports fixing in the United States. Back in the Dominican Republic, some 23 American bookies who thought they had a sure thing are now locked up in this Dominican prison, out of action. And at the bookies' high-tech nerve center, with two more big NFL games this Sunday, American bettors are still calling in. People in the sporting world say it will be much more difficult to place a bet with a bookie on this weekend's big games. But bookies and gamblers are resourceful people, and law enforcement authorities say they are sure to come up with a way to get back in action in time for the Super Bowl. Tom? Thanks, Brian. This involves one of the biggest bookmaking busts in history. Anthony Lebo of Santa Rosa already has one bookmaking conviction. He is among 16 people indicted in San Francisco for alleged connections to a huge sports betting operation. Federal agents say the ring, centered in the Dominican Republic capital of Santo Domingo, had mob ties in New York and Bay Area connections as well. We believe it's the biggest bookmaking operation in the United States. The 14 in court today allegedly used 1-800 numbers to take bets for high-stakes gamblers and bookies throughout the United States. Five others have pleaded guilty already. We asked Lebeau's attorney if the government has a strong case. I believe that some of their information is reliable, and it does appear that, that the scope, that is, the uh, quantity of wagers being accepted is uh, comparatively a large one. FBI surveillance and search at this pawn shop in San Francisco's Mission District. You may remember the owner, Daryl Kaplan. He made news when he found William Saroyan's Oscar and donated it to a Fresno museum. Although pawn shop owner Daryl Kaplan has not been indicted in this case, U.S. Attorney William McGiven says the volume of bookmakers checks allegedly cashed through this shop was tremendous. Indicated in the case appeared in San Francisco federal court today. They're accused of acting as bookies in a huge sports betting ring that took in as much as $100 million a month.